the time, I'd never heard of a near-death experience. And it took about four or five months for me to find out what had happened to me. Although I did try to describe what had happened to my doctor, uh, to my family doctor, doctor, and to the cardiac specialist afterward, and they, uh, as you probably heard at this conference earlier, they didn't think much of it, um, classified it as a religious experience. I said, no, 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 it wasn't. It was a mystical experience, perhaps, or a spiritual experience, not a religious experience. So I went through all of that. Uh, it was only by accident that I found out during the fall that what I'd had was a near-death experience. I was watching television, I turned on the Knowledge Network, I think it was with the PBS halfway through a program on near-death experiences. I was sure I was supposed to go out and work with dying people and be a chaplain, and I went out and I went back to school and I prepared myself for this, and I went into the hospitals, and I went and I worked for hospice, and I couldn't stand it. <laughs> I couldn't stand the way the patients were being treated. I was so mad at the doctors. I was so mad at, and they, they weren't uh, an impatient person. And uh, it was very, very hard, hard for me. And so I had to leave it completely behind. That when we're confronted with dying patients, <coughs> instead of the medical isolation, in the techno hysteria that surrounds death. Let me tell you how people die now. This this now from a doctor's point of view. Okay, this is, you know, and I'm, what I'm saying, by the way, is not controversial. This comes right out of a book called Understanding Death and Dying, which is the textbook used at the University of Washington, and also from my own experiences, obviously. But okay, as someone, once the diagnosis of a fatal disease is made, visits to the bedside are briefer and fewer and conversations become more stilted and less animated and less personal. As a person comes closer to death, physician visits are fewer and fewer until, this, get this, until the person actually dies. Oh, then it's a whole different story. Then everybody's piling into the room. Then, as I have run many of these resuscitations, then the first thing I have to do as a resuscitation leader is say, half of you people clear out. Well, they should have been there 30 minutes before. Okay. This is a, uh, my son Sean died of uh, um, leukemia at age uh, five. This mom had a near-death experience when she was a child. So she's aware. She knows. Do you see what I'm saying? Used to be, we understood what the natural and supernatural aspects of death and dying were. None of this, this whole lecture that I've given to you today would not have come as any news to people a thousand years ago, or 10,000 years ago, or 30,000 years ago. It's only recently we've forgotten what happens with death. In fact, when medieval commentators talk about death, it's fascinating that they mix in together the natural and supernatural effects, because they don't distinguish between them. You know, uh, one minute he's commenting when the person gets near death, their skin's going to kind of turn blue, and their respirations are going to go fast, and, you know, and their perfusion will be poor. But then interspersed, he'll say, and he'll also be seeing God, and he'll also be calling his family together, because the process of dying is one that used to be with dignity and control, and now has become dehumanized by our medical technology. hear this. Okay. I have no fear of my own death, but to face the death of your own child is quite a different thing. Okay, and then she tells me the medical details uh, and such as that. Okay, in November, um, he uh, had, had an infection as these patients often do, and it became uh, blue and had to be resuscitated. Um, he was successfully resuscitated, and he turned to his mom and he said, where did that lady go? That's all he said. Where did that lady go? That is a statement which easily could have been ignored or lost, or forgotten. I think that in most hospitals, that would have been assumed that it was some artifact of resuscitation or something along those lines. I said, what lady? The lady that was here. And then he wouldn't tell me any more. I called my pediatrician, and when I told her about it, she explained about neurons in the brain. <laughs> okay. All right. Now he's at the process of dying, and 
he actually, she actually uses this information. She tells him, go to the light. It's okay. It's okay to die now. One of the nurses takes her aside and says, you know something? Sometimes patients hang on for their families. Why don't you just let him go? A beautiful interchange. And then the mom actually says to the child, it's okay, Sean. You're tired now. You can go. Once he said, is it bad to die? And he says, no. So, you know, even his own uh, experience did not particularly help him. But then finally, at the point of death, he says, turn out the light. Turn out the light. It's making me hot. And finally, he said, there's someone out there. And those were his final, you know, those were his final words. Now, the beautiful, you know, the, that's beautiful enough, but listen to this. Then she tells me that she talked this over with her pediatrician. And her pediatrician said, you know, these things are very common. But we're so busy in hospitals today that we often ignore or dismiss these ex experiences. So it's not my own perception. You see, and I think this is very, very common, that this kind of thing happens, that we ignore or dismiss these experiences. That it, with the hustle and bustle of our hospital routines, we have forgotten what the natural processes of dying are. I know that I did as a doctor. Maybe we need to push all those machines back from the bedside, not get rid of them. We need those machines. But maybe we just need to put longer tubes on them so you know we can get some people into the bedside, too. I get these letters from people who say, now I understand that when my son said to me two years, uh, you know, two months before he was accidentally shot with a handgun, two months before he said, Mom, I'm going to be dying soon, and I don't want you to be afraid. And she just kind of, oh, what are you talking about? And then two months later, accidentally shot with a handgun. And then they go through his pictures, and they find that he has drawn actual pictures of his own death, and even had a picture of his own grave site and such as that, complete with the, ex you know, an exact replica of the, uh, you know, the grave marker that was next to him, and, you know, things that obviously come to him from a precognitive way. How would he, you know, he doesn't know where he's going to be buried at, at that age. And what's even more fascinating about this is that this is a seemingly accidental death. <coughs> a boy is playing at a party and a handgun is discharged. And yet, her understanding now that the presentiments of death and the pre-death visions that he had were valid and real gave her tremendous comfort. I believe because of the way our society is, because we lack an understanding of support of these things, that we just tend to kind of trivialize them. And yet they have the seeds of healing. And I just, I'd, I'd like to just read you uh, one more letter. This is from a woman whose sister had a pre-death vision. I believe my sister gained more insight through her near-death experience than can ever be passed into words. And she passed that insight to me, although it didn't start to manifest itself and, until I started to really understand that unseen power and let it work in my life. From then on, things have been happening in my life that I call no less than the gifts of life. That's what I think of the near-death experience, a reminder to us of the gifts of life.